choir now. The choir is growing. Sunday just before the sermon. <laughs> check, check, test, test. We good? All right. Well, this morning we continue our series on We Believe, sort of these uh, major beliefs that we hold in the United Methodist Church. Now, understanding, though, that just because I say this is what we believe as United Methodists doesn't mean that all of you believe them exactly this way. That's what makes United, Meth United Methodism so fun is that we have all sorts of varying degrees of belief in these areas. We're a really beautiful spectrum rainbow of beliefs in this place, and so I love that. Um, we have a big tent and a big table, and we all come to it looking at things a little differently, and so we praise God for that. And so just a quick little bit of review. We talked about the fact that this denomination began was began by John and Charles Wesley, these two brothers, these Anglican priests, who never meant to start a new denomination. And yet here we are. They remained Anglican priests till the day they died. John Wesley was never a Methodist. He was always an Anglican priest, despite Methodism starting and growing and becoming one of the predominant denominations in the country. I do believe one out of every three Americans was a Methodist at one point in this country's history. Truly was a great denomination and still continues to be. So a couple of our our beliefs, a couple of our things that we've gone over. We talked about the fact that we believe in God. One God expressed in the Trinity, expressed in three. God the Creator, Jesus the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit. We talked about how we believe in Jesus. That, that through Christ, God being fully revealed in Christ, came to reconcile us to God through his life, his teachings, his death and resurrection on the cross. And then we talked about the this work of the Holy Spirit, that we believe that the Holy Spirit is God present working in us through God's grace. Not a lesser part of the Trinity, not Jesus' ghost or Casper the friendly ghost of some sort, but God present in us working through grace. And we talked about those beautiful expressions of grace that are taking place in our life. Pervenient grace, that grace of God wooing us into a relationship, justifying grace, that grace of making things right, and sanctifying grace, the grace that slowly and surely over time transforms us more into more, more like Jesus Christ in our life and in our actions. That this personal relationship between us, us and God has social and political and worldwide implications, right? We are not just saved from something, we are saved what? For something. God saves us for something. And now today we're all going to talk about Scripture, that we believe in the guidance of Scripture. Roger read that wonderful set of verses. I won't read them again, but this, this conversation about the Word of life, the Word of God. And often when we refer to the Word of God, we think we're talking about the Bible, but really the Word of God is who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. God revealed and become flesh. And so as we talk about Scripture, the Bible, we're thinking about God's story. Right, this amazing book that lays out God's story. It's our story connecting with that story. And as our story connects with that story, that story continues to be written in the world around us. And so we, before we dig into what we believe, um, I want to talk about the book for a moment. You all have Bibles nearby. Josh showed that there's Bibles you can get on your phone, which is wonderful. Uh, I often use BibleGateway.com. Uh, you can listen to the Bible, you can read the Bible, you can, in multiple languages and multiple translations, so many different ways to hear and read and understand Scripture. So the Bible is a group of ancient writings compiled over more than 4,000 years. So this 4,000-year span of writings all compiled together. No part is less than 2,000 years old. It's a pretty old book, isn't it? I do believe it is the number one bestseller of all time. And continues to be in multiple languages. They don't put it on the New York Times bestseller list, but it just is. Outselling everything. Um, it is 66 separate books and writings compiled or written by 40 different authors, divided into two sections. In, in the spring, I'm going to do a Bible 101 class, uh, Sunday mornings after church. And so we'll go into more detail on all this. But you've got the Old Testament, the New Testament. 39 of those are in the Old Testament. 27 are of those are in the New Testament. 
It was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and not modern Greek, but an ancient Koine Greek. And it has been in the form that we know it since 375 AD, with the Old Testament being kind of gathered together far before that. And so when Jesus and the disciples and, and others were talking about Scripture, they were referring to the Old Testament. It's not a linear story. If you sit down in Genesis 1 and read through Revelation, you'll, it's going to go all over the place. It's not linear. Remember, ancient history is told differently than modern history. And ancient writings and storytelling was done far different than modern storytelling. Um, it's not linear. Some of the books are out of order. And some of the books tell the exact same thing from someone else's perspective. And that's a little frustrating sometimes, right? And, and yet at the same time, it helps paint a bit better picture. Not all faith traditions in the umbrella of Christianity, right, the larger church, have the same number of books in their Bible. If you were at a Greek Orthodox church and you opened the Bible in the pew, you would find 72 books. Right? If you were Ethiopian Orthodox, you may think, what? There's a lot of those. You would find 81 books. And if you were Roman Catholic, maybe some of you have been, there's 73 books in their Bible. And that's a whole other discussion, how we all got to these different things. And so you save that for Bible 101 later on. This bottom line is the scriptures that we hold were written by communities of faith who experienced God's presence and interaction with them. They had this amazing experience with God, and they had to tell the story of what God did. Those differences in those stories are there because they're personal. Of course, without the Bible, we wouldn't be talking about Jesus necessarily. We would know nothing of the Trinity, of redemption, or the work of grace. And when we tell of what God does in our lives, and so when you're saying, you know what God did? You know what God did? We were praying in this amazing thing, or we were singing in this amazing thing. When you tell those stories, you continue to tell that story. I love that the book of Acts starts with the, the writer back saying, you know, I'm going to tell you all of the things that God began to do, right? the things that started out. In other words, it's just the beginning. There's no the end at the end of the Bible. And so that's amazing. And so your life is being written. Your, the story of God in your life is being written today. Article 5. So now I'm going to, in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, which is not the Bible, um, despite what some folks maybe think, it's not the Bible. <laughs> says this, that the, that the Bible contains all things necessary for salvation. The Bible contains all things necessary. And like in a good United Methodist fashion, that's a really open-ended statement, isn't it? It contains all things necessary. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's all in there. It's all good. It's all there. There's no secret knowledge that you need to understand Scripture. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to have a preacher with you when you read the Bible. You know, there was a time in history when only the people up here could even read the Bible or even talk about it. You know, they spoke in Latin and you didn't get to speak in Latin. And so they sort of had the, the secret knowledge of Scripture. So when they put pulpits way up on these things, right? If you've been to a cathedral in, in Europe, because that person, that priest had all the knowledge. And you all sit there and are passive receivers of the knowledge, hoping that that guy isn't putting a twist on it. He probably was. <laughs> but you didn't know. We live in a time where we all have access to it. And there's no fear in gathering. You can gather with other people and read the scriptures, and you're not going to get off. right? You're not going to create some wild thing because the Holy Spirit is there to teach. And scripture is accessible to all. What God is doing for us and what God has done for us. What God promises us. What God expects of us is in that book. One of the things we say is that we don't make any theological statements that don't arise out of scripture. And we also make sure that all of our theological statements are answerable to scripture. Does that make sense? We try to make sure that what we say about God can be found there. There will be times, though... This is us being United Methodists. I'll step over here from that statement. Where we read something in Scripture, and then our experience with God, and our reason, and our tradition all disagree. And then we have to let it live in tension. And I'll tell you, that's okay. 
Sometimes that's a beautiful thing. And so you begin to wrestle and struggle and pray and worship. There was a time in my life where I would read something in Scripture and then I'd experience this over here and go, huh. And so I'd say, well, that my experience must be wrong. The Holy Spirit must be doing something else. Or, or I'm misinterpreting because the Bible says this. And so then you have to keep wrestling. And sometimes those start to jive. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. We've got to read it, though, don't we? If we don't read the scriptures, if we don't open the Bible, then, what, then we're not learning and growing. John Wesley listed this idea. He said, searching the scriptures is a means of grace. Is a means of grace. Spending time in the Bible is a means of grace right alongside communion, right alongside baptism, right alongside being in church and worshiping God and serving in the community. Reading the Bible is a means of grace. How do we do that? How do we read this thing, this 66 books with 40 authors written over thousands of years? We read it as God's story, God's creation, love for humanity of sinfulness in that relationship and of God bringing us back. Wesley believed, first of all, that we never read the Bible in a vacuum. We don't. When you come to the Bible, you have to understand that everything you have in your life comes with you, doesn't it? And if you think it doesn't, then you may be fooling yourselves. Every single one of us opened the Bible with something that we bring to it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. When we read the Bible, you should begin with prayer. Next time you sit down to read scripture, I encourage you to start with a prayer. And it could be the prayer of, Lord, I don't want to do this. That's okay. Or, Lord, last time I did this, I got really confused. Ask God to lead you in that time. That the Holy Spirit would enlighten and enliven your reading. Wrestle with it. I love Josh sharing that him and, him and his grandma and Roz got together last night. And they opened up these different Bible translations. And maybe some commentaries. And they tried to make sense of this. Commentaries are a wonderful thing. In other words, reading what others have said about that scripture. You know, there's 2,000 years of the church. People have said some things about these verses, haven't they? And so why not dig into it? You don't have to agree with that. You may open a commentary and go, well, phooey on that. Don't assume that person's right because they have a bunch of letters after or before their name. I don't agree with them all. So we want to read scripture with prayer. We want to read scripture with with, with other sources. And we want to do it in community. You know, it's one thing to read the Bible by yourself. How much better is it to read it with people? To read it together? That's why we still read scripture in church. That's why we still have this. We do it together. Get with a couple people regularly and read it. Discuss it. The Book of Discipline says this. We are aided by scholarly inquiry and personal insight under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. As we work with each text, we take into account that we have been able to learn about the original content, context and intention of the text. In this understanding, we draw upon careful historical, literary, and textual studies of recent years. You see, when we read the Bible, we have to do it critically and devotionally. Wesley said, regardless of your education level, be critical with it. Allow it to speak to you. It's important not to focus on bits of the Bible. How many of you ignore the Old Testament? In your studies, <laughs> great, raise his hand. The rest of you, you just love you love Leviticus, don't you? Uh, things that cause uncleanliness—that's your favorite. Just man, uh, all the things you must sacrifice, depending on the sin that you've committed. Those are just a hoot, right? <laughs> Numbers. Let's count up all the different things. There are four hundred Hittites and the Amalekites, and we'll just read them. And I know you gather around the dinner table and you just enjoy that stuff. Um, we do. Sometimes we ignore different parts of Scripture. Or sometimes we focus on, we say, man, I love the book of John. I just read John every day. Or I love Psalms. Or I, I just love certain Psalms. Because if you read all the Psalms, some of them are kind of, you want to like go, David, did you need a hug? Or, you know, he's just having a rough day. So we need to read it all. We need to read it and see, as, as Wesley called it, the general tenure or the whole scope of Scripture. Seeing that God's story, the story of God redeeming humanity, is all the way through it. This beautiful thread is woven through it. Even the parts that drive us crazy and make absolutely no sense. 
even the parts that are so contextually bound up, and what I mean by that is they're a product of their history and their culture maybe, you know, 3,000 years ago. Even those parts, we have to read it and see. So, so, for example, we see the grace of God when we read the story of Joseph. God, you know, bringing him out of slavery to save the Israelites, etc. We see that same grace in Jesus Christ. And so we see grace over and over. And so we read the whole thing. We need to make sure when we read it, we don't pull verses out of context. You ever heard the statement, proof texting? Proof texting is when you have an opinion about the Bible or about God or about faith, and then you go to the Bible and you find ten verses that help your opinion. <laughs> Ignoring all the verses around it. I'll give you an example. My brother was at a Bible study. Uh, my brother has a few tattoos on his body. And somebody at the Bible study made sure to point out that the Old Testament says tattoos are a sin. And he was real upset. He goes, man, I'm just trying to understand. You know, I'm just going to a Bible study. He goes, I don't think I'm going to go anymore. And I said, well, did you remind him that in that same chapter it talks about slavery and how it's a good thing? Well, no, I didn't know that. And that it says you're not supposed to cut the sides of your, you know, right here, well, the, the, the locks in your hair. That you're not supposed to wear fabric with different uh, threads. How many of you have multi-fabric, right? Cotton blend? Sin. Um, <laughs> shellfish? Sin. And so on. The point is that people love to, you know, that person probably just didn't like tattoos, which is an opinion, right? Some of you can't stand them. Some of you love them. But that's an opinion. And they went to the Bible and they found something to support their opinion. That's proof texting. We have to be careful we don't do that. I've watched pastors proof text to the point that they even choose scriptures from multiple translations to fit their opinion. Proof text so hard that it's uh, like sprain an ankle doing it. It's so intense. <laughs> we also can't set aside or ignore scripture that we don't like. There are times when I'm laying out the scripture reading for Sunday and I'm looking that I'll be going, eh, I'm like, oh, we should stop there. Because that next one is just kind of wonky and it's going to throw people. And then they're going to come up after church and go, what was that? And I'll be thinking, I should have just left it out, huh? But it's there. And so we do good work. We, we deal with it. We don't go to the doctor and say, you know what, doctor, you can check everything. But you know, my right foot, just stay away. Yeah, but you're limping. I, I know. See, we've got to deal with it all. We don't isolate verses. We don't pull them out of context. We realize that the context is so important. When the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, he wrote that in a specific time in history, from a specific place, with a specific purpose to a specific people. And so there's things that are there for that. And then there's things that speak to us 2,000 years later. We can't do all of those things because when we do that, we ignore the big story. We ignore the big narrative. That from the beginning of Genesis all the way through is the story of God redeeming us. God working to bring us back. This love story of God wooing. Like all good stories, it gets off on some weird trails, but we still journey down them. In John 5, verse 9, Jesus said this, You study the scriptures diligently because, in the, because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And then he says, Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He's telling the Hebrews, You read all along. I was in there. They talked about me. And so as we read scripture, we have to be really careful to read scripture through the lens of Jesus. When we do that, we see it come to life. And so we read all of scripture through the lens of Jesus. We even interpret it through what I like to say as like a colander of Jesus, right? Through the Jesus filter. Does this verse sift out through the, through the work and life? And teachings of Jesus. Martin Luther said that the Bible is like swaddling clothes wrapped around the baby Jesus. We also need to be careful that we don't worship the Bible. We don't worship the Bible. That's important. There are some denominations that are coming awfully close to worshiping the Bible. One of my seminary professors said this, you know, regarding Jesus in the Bible. He said, we need the man and we need the book. We need 
to be careful that we don't have the book without the man, right? The book without the man is often conservative theology. We also need to be careful that we don't have the man without the book. That's awfully, as we get more progressive, we sort of set aside and we have this Jesus that we just worship minus the Bible. We have to have both. It's almost as if in one hand we have scripture, over here we have Jesus, and they work together. And so through the lens of Jesus, most of all, John Wesley stressed practical divinity, that as we read, as we study, that as we wrestle with scripture, we should then go and do scripture. That we don't read something like, love your neighbor. That's so nice. Oh my gosh, my neighbor's dog. Right? I say that because there's this little dog about three houses down right now. Um, I'm going to go rescue it. But you do, right? You have to respond and do. Jesus didn't just say those things like in the Sermon on the Mount to make us feel good. He said those things so we would actually do them. It's to be read, it's to be pondered, it's to be lived, and it's to be embodied. And the Bible should be transformative in our lives. Wesley said that we should read Scripture constantly. In other words, read it as an, in a regular way. We should read it carefully. We should read it seriously. We should read it fruitfully. In other words, immediately practicing what we've learned. In early Methodist Bible studies, you know what they would do? They would then have a time of confession and forgiveness. They wouldn't just study the Bible. They would do that. And then they would say, okay, now let's ask each other. How are you doing with that? How are you doing at loving your neighbor? Eh, not good. And they would actually meet in those sort of groups, these Wesley Covenant groups. And did you know up until the early 1900s, you couldn't go to church on Sunday if you didn't go to that group in, during the week as a Methodist? Isn't that weird? You got a ticket to church at the midweek meeting. I know you think, no way. <laughs> There's some strange uh, correlation that the United Methodist Church, or the Methodist Church, at that time as a Methodist Church, was growing, growing, growing as that was taking place. Outpacing the growth of the U.S. population, late 1800s, early 1900s. And then they made that change. They, well, you can just come to church. You don't have to do any study during the week. And guess what happened to the decline began? Interesting. Interesting. Now, correlation doesn't equal causation, but there's something to think about there. It's interesting. Lastly, what is, what is the Bible and what it isn't? First of all, the Bible is not necessarily just ancient history. It's presently available for us to experience. It's not a science textbook. We don't go to Genesis to look for science, right? We also don't go to Genesis to look for history the way we know history. You do realize that ancient Middle Eastern people told history different than we do. We tell history very linear, don't we? That's how we went to school, okay? This happened, and then this happened, and then whoever wrote the textbook ignored this. Um, the dominant culture ignored this, and then this happened, and then this happened, right? Back then, it wasn't about that. They sat around in the, in the you know, as a nomadic people, and they told stories about what God was doing with creation. And then us modern people came along, and we said, well, that must be exactly how it happened. And if you don't believe that it's exactly how it happened, then you're not a good believer. No, no. It's not a science book. It's not a historical thing back in the way back when. And when we boil it down to that, we miss out on so much. When you take Genesis 1 and 2 and make it a science book, boy, do you miss out. You miss out on this beautiful narrative about God and creation. Bottom line is it's a love story that God invites you to be part of. It's easy to read scripture with the attitude that this isn't really for me. It's just an exercise that I do. But I want to challenge you with the words from 1 Samuel. Speak. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. God, how do you want to invite me into this love story? And so as you read scripture and as you study and even as you sing, you know, as we sing these hymns and these praise on scriptures there, as you hear it read, as you hear it prayed, God, invite me into that love story. Continue that love story in my life. If this book is your love story to me, how then can I take that love story and extend it out beyond the walls of this place in my life? It's the challenge. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, your servants are listening. 
We confess, God, that that Bible sometimes drives us crazy. Sometimes it confuses the heck out of us. It's hard. Lord, forgive us when in our history as Christians we've used the Bible as a weapon. Forgive us when we've used the Bible to separate people, to condemn people, to push people away. God, forgive us for that. Help us to see that it is your love story to us. Help us to read it. Help us to wrestle with it, God. I pray that it would be a means of grace in each of our lives, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand. Our closing hymn is, uh, Lead Us, Lead Me, Lord. So let's stand and worship to Lead Me, Lord. <laughs>